to make this panel great and to work out well, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Katya Soldak, who is editorial director of Force Media International Edition. Please welcome, Katya. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right, while we're moving uh, some chairs here a little bit, um, I want to introduce this panel. I don't think I could introduce it better than it's been introduced before because I find that um, it's been 11 months since Russia started all-out war on Ukraine. And uh, especially for Western audience, there are a lot of conversations that become somewhat abstract when uh, talks about war do not incorporate the actual real fight that's happening on the front lines. And uh, right now we have this unique opportunity to hear from people who experience this horrific war firsthand. We're going to have four panelists here and uh, some of them fought for months, were wounded, some of them were in Russian captivity. And uh, I would like to welcome them on this stage. Three of them will be in person and one person will be connecting with us via video. So uh, let's honor and welcome our panelists and give them a round of applause. I would like you, everybody, to come up on stage as I am introducing you. Um, well, take chairs that you prefer. Um, um, we're going to have Masi Nayem with us here, who is coming up on stage right now. And I'm pretty sure that many of you are familiar with our guests today, but nevertheless. Uh, Masi Nayem is an officer and lieutenant of the armed forces of Ukraine. In 2022, after a full-scale invasion, he joined the ranks of military intelligence. Lawyer by training, Masi founded his own law firm that specializes in legal services to public figures, activists, and military. Military. We also have Yulia Payevska, call sign Tyra. Julia is a Ukrainian military service woman, medic, and volunteer. Yulia was in Mariupol, a port city in the southern Ukraine that was under the blockade for three weeks and is now occupied by the Russian forces. Yulia was captured and imprisoned by the Russian forces for three months before she was released in June 2022. <laughs> and we also have Ilya Samoylenko, call sign Gandalf. He's a Ukrainian serviceman, intelligence officer of the Azov Regiment of the National Guard of Ukraine. Before the war, Ilya studied history at the university in Kyiv. From the beginning of the blockade of Mariupol, together with his colleagues, he was at Azovstal, a steel plant where thousands of civilians and military were hiding in the basements for weeks. He was taken prisoner of war after the Russian forces took control over the plant and was released in a prisoner swap in September. And we're going to have a fourth person connecting with us from one of the hottest front lines that we have in eastern Ukraine right now. Uh, Yehor Firsov is connecting with us via video link. Uh, we can see him now. Yehor, can you hear us? Can we see you? Can we hear you? Well, let me introduce him first. Yehor is a medic in the Ukrainian military. He was a member of the Ukrainian parliament from 2014 to 2016. And after February 24th, Yehor joined the territorial defense and later got medical training and joined the army on the front lines. <laughs> Yehor, hello. How can we make sure he's uh, hearing us? Glory to Ukraine, I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, with people who are here? Oh. 
Okay, so um, as I said, it is very important to hear from people who did fight in person and uh, had this experience that uh, is unbelievably hard. And uh, I would like to start with my CNIM, who will share with us his perspective on what's going on and on what work he's done and what's needed the most. And uh, I'm just gonna let you speak, Masi. Oh, I'm so sorry for a second. I wanted to say that our panel is in two languages, so you should use the translating device. Channel one is English, channel two is Ukrainian. Sorry. I'm sorry I haven't got um, a very good English, so I will speak in Ukrainian. First of all, uh, as to what's going on uh, at the battlefield in Ukraine, you know, uh, when you are getting married, you usually um, vow to uh, be together with that person till uh, death you part. Uh, but uh, in uh, this case, uh, you do not have an opportunity to prove it, that you will stay till the end with this person. Uh, in Ukraine, we have got this opportunity to live up to our commitments, to our vows, to uh, freedom, to democracy, to the um, values that we share. Uh, when you leave this uh, room and you walk uh, the streets of the city, how can you uh, become a hero? By crossing uh, the street where it is necessary. Here it is almost impossible to become an, a, a hero, but in Ukraine, every man and woman can become a hero. And uh, if you uh, stay uh, at the front line, uh, you do not think of uh, some commitments back in the rear, but you live there, you feel the pulse of this war. But even in the rear, people uh, understand what's going on. Um, and uh, those who are at the front line and um, uh, military medics, uh, they see blood uh, every day. And um, in Ukraine, what's going on now is uh, sheer heroism, and it is the occasion for us to live up to our commitments, um, uh, to the vows, to the promises that we make, uh, remembering about our values. We say that we value freedom, but imagine uh, we are cornered now uh, uh, with a uh, uh, gun uh, put to our head. We will all, um, understand what freedom is only then. That's exactly what is happening in Ukraine. Um, I remember before I was wounded, uh, the day uh, close to uh, the Ukrainian uh, city of Slavinsk, I saw a young boy who was uh, walking in the street and he uh, ran up to our APC and I asked him what he was doing there. It was dangerous. He said, I, I'm walking just, I uh, asked him whether he wanted uh, an apple. Uh, he he offer, offered me an apple and I saw a reflection of myself in that boy. I come from Afghanistan. I have led Afghanistan Afghanistan uh, for Ukraine to uh, fr from the war there, and now I understand that Ukraine is in a similar situation. Uh, it is fighting uh, our common aggressor, Russia. Uh, so I uh, believe that uh, tough times uh, give rise to true values. Tough times, difficult times, because when you, we live in uh, peace uh, time, uh, we uh, are living, um, we are earning our living, and we and entertain, we uh, enjoy life, but in tough times you are tried and tested and I believe that Ukraine is living through this trial uh, in a very dignified way. Uh, Ukrainians are the last uh, romantics of uh, Europe. We've lived through this uh, story with uh, Russia from the very first day. When I came to Ukraine from Afghanistan, I understood that this conflict is protracted. It is uh, centuries long. 
And I would like to thank those Ukra Europeans and Americans who have realized how important it is to support Ukrainians, because it's not our life that we are defending in Ukraine. We are defending our common values, values that we all share. And there should be no prejudice amongst you that you provide us with weapons, with, uh, with armaments, uh, just in order to stave off of the war, for the war not to come to your home. It's not about it. Any person uh, of any country, of any nationality and ethnicity is dying together with Ukrainians there because um, every death chips away something of every human soul. And being a true Afghani, uh, I can tell you that what you you, uh, we are all doing is too little because every day of delaying, of shilly shelling and dally dallying, takes somebody's uh, life, and thus the humanity is is suffering because we should be thinking about preserving the human race and do it quickly, right now. Thank you. I can see that. Uh, uh, I knew it would happen to me. Uh, <laughs> so I see that Ihor is connecting with us right now. Ihor, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you very well. Glory to Ukraine. Ihor, can you please tell us to your best ability what you can share? Uh, where are you right now? What is happening around you? and uh, any details that you can share with us from your location and from your day. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am now uh, together with my battalion close to the town of Svatove at the crossroads of uh, Kharkiv, uh, Luhansk, and Donetsk regions of Ukraine. And before that, I uh, was close to Bakhmut and Solidar uh, together with my battalion. Any processes can be put on hold but the war, it is going on. And even though the media today are speaking very actively about combat uh, in Solidar and Bakhmut, I can tell you that the entire uh, front line, Marinka, Piski, Svatova, um, Avdivka, uh, uh, to uh, the um, battle is uh, going on everywhere. And um, I can tell you that the conditions are very hard. We, the Territorial Defense, act as infantry. So conditions, living conditions, fighting conditions are very tough. We have to be at the um, uh, zero line, that is, at the very front line. And we live in uh, trenches, on the ground. Uh, on weeks and weeks on end uh, with the temperature plus uh, 2 Celsius or minus 20 Celsius when there is a lot, uh, a lot of water under your uh, feet uh, in the trenches when it is uh, below freezing temperature and you suffer from, uh, from uh, frostbites. Several um, guys um, of our battalion lost uh, their limbs uh, because of the frostbites. And your hygienic procedures, all of that becomes a, an everyday challenge. Another thing about the infantry is that infantry suffers from all of the shelling and shooting all the time. Mines, grenades, uh, artillery, uh, rocket artillery and tube artillery. And uh, in some other regions, uh, you uh, hear about uh, this. But when you are at the front line, at the zero line, you do not listen to the news because you are the news. You live the news. And that makes your life uh, fairly tough. And as I said, we, the infantry, have to meet the enemy um, despite everything, against all odds. We have to meet the enemy and uh, fight it uh, and um, 
drive them away from our uh, life. Even with sabotage and reconnaissance groups, we have to be very vigilant to identify uh, them and uh, destroy them. And um, I am a paramedic, and when we work together with uh, drivers to medevac uh, our wounded, um, concoct, or injured, uh, we also uh, work 24-7. Um, and the most regular or most prevalent uh, wounds are uh, those um, caused by shrapnel. This is a piece of shrapnel that uh, I removed from a body of uh, my comrade in arms. From actually from his uh, uh, flag uh, um, jacket. Uh, he survived, uh, but uh, um, he was wounded. And uh, you can find uh, this shrapnel everywhere. It is just a piece of metal, nothing special. But uh, where we are, we receive hundreds or even thousands such fragments of shrapnel. Uh, they cut uh, trees as uh, knives. They um, cause a lot of damage to us. Uh, they wound a lot of people. And sometimes they're lethal. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they're huge. And uh, the uh, defenders might not even realize uh, that they were wounded by a tiny piece of shrapnel um, for hours and they would continue fighting unless uh, they get this internal hemorrhage and they suffer a lot. But again, as I said, despite everything, despite um, incessant shelling and shooting, we are holding the line. We are putting up fierce resistance, and the key factor of our resilience and resistance is our brotherhood, is our feeling of uh, the elbow of your comrade and brother in arms. You cannot even uh, define or describe the aura uh, at the front line in, uh, and the morale of our defenders. When the enemy's tank is firing against our positions, um, if they do not hurt our you know, foxhole uh, but um, fall somewhere nearby, you may uh, suffer from concoction, but you um, survive. And you can only survive is if your um, brother in arms during this shelling, during this shooting, runs uh, to your rescue and dogs you out from uh, the rubble of uh, the foxhole. So when uh, the defenders um, thus uh, help one another, uh, we um, can see this uh, front brotherhood. Uh, I saw lots of such situations. I haven't got uh, uh, under such conditions, but I'm sure that if this happens to me, I will be rescued by uh, my um, uh, fellow um, uh, fellow uh, servicemen. Uh, what um, makes us happy is the news about the new deliveries of arms, weapons, and other military kit to Ukraine. Uh, when I was serving close to Adivka, and our basic task was to keep the line, not to recede, not uh, to go on the uh, on the retraction uh, now we are ready to go forward uh, to go on the offensive yesterday we heard, uh, we overheard the um telephone conversation that was tapped of uh, two military, Russian military uh, servicemen and they are shocked because even though they know that they uh, keep us under constant barrage of shells, we are, uh, we are invincible. We are standing our ground. We are standing tall and we understand when we hear them speak like this, we understand that we are there for a true cause and that we are doing the right thing. And you are prepared to do even more to move ahead and liberate all of the occupied territories. Uh, so I'm Soldier Firsov and uh, Roger. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing these details with us. Uh, I, I would like to follow up very quickly on what you said. From what I remember, Avdivka is your hometown, right? Um, can you just share with us what is it like or what was that like when you were stationed next to your hometown fighting uh, the enemy? Uh, 
You know, when I was I, I was trying to 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 get to uh, a Avdivka uh, regiment because I knew the local situation was very helpful in terms of evacuating people uh, in in tactical uh, healthcare. But it turned out that this is a shortcoming rather than an advantage, tactically speaking, because I can walk through Avdivka with my eyes closed. I I, I know those places when I was so. Uh, Walking with my girlfriend, with my grandma, uh, when I uh, the the route that I was taking to to school, and in these ordinary districts and blocks of our city is 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 horror because my school, for example, was destroyed completely. The school where I was working as a teacher was devastated as well. So this is like we've lived through the sec. This school has survived the Second World War and. This school hasn't survived this third world war, I would say. So it's extremely difficult to comprehend because you see two pictures. One, a picture in your head, in in your your mental picture, what you you've memorized from your childhood. You always remember from from the childhood some bright pictures of joy, and and so so you have this parallel reality your reminiscences and what you see with your own eyes but you know all of these emotions they motivate you feel this huge motivation and and you're trying to convert this anger into your actions sharing that i hope you can stay connected with us for a little while and we'll come back with more questions uh, our next panelist is Ilya Samoylenko and uh, we would like to hear your perspective on what you've been through. Tell us uh, any details that you feel comfortable sharing with us. I know all the subjects we discuss here are very hard, but we need to speak about them so the world knows. Uh, please share with us what you can. Uh, since the panel is international, so we would prefer to stay in English, but uh, about personal perspective and about the hardness and about harshness of conditions and decisions. When I'm looking back in the, the pre on the previous year, I'm just thinking like it was a very hard year, really, but not for me. Like it's for me, it's a state of norma. It's the things that we were preparing all the time, and the previous speakers told a lot of really valuable things, really truthful things about your uh, combat brotherhood about your dedication, about the people who are volunteering to join the military, about the people who are trying to, you know, uh, to improve the, uh, the situation wh where they are right now, about the people who are suffering from the serious, uh, like, traumas, like when they're seeing their hometowns destroyed and plundered. But uh, the heroism yeah, can be taught. We can teach how to be a hero. Yeah, personally, like I hear a lot about me, about myself, and about my f uh, fellow fellow comrades that were heroes. We didn't think so. We don't think so, because we we're just doing our job. We're just doing things that we have chosen to do. It was very sane choice, choice that we made a lot of years ago. Like uh, I left my civilian life in 2000, in the beginning of 2016. I joined Azov. Yeah, why I joined Azov? Because, like, I know that the uh, point of view and perspective of this unit is the best way for the things that we are doing. Yeah, and what we were doing, we were reinventing the army, but in the normal way. A lot of people, like, let's let, let's see the uh, the truth, like, transparently. Yeah, all of the uh, uh, combat st structures, all of the armies in the world have their problems. Uh, the the system of the army itself, yeah, it reduces the human potential to his functional responsibilities. But uh, we also value the human per, uh, perspective and the human potential. Yeah, and we're trying to improve the situation as much as possible. We're trying to utilize all of the resources yeah, and to provide the maximum effort from the from the minimal resources. Yeah, about the, uh, talking about the minimal resources here yeah, for the last like all of the eight years of the Russian-Ukrainian war, we have not received any kind of uh, military aid uh, with Western weaponry and modern techniques. Well, so uh, we, we received zero uh, combat training from Western partners, well, that's, but that's okay. And we made this for ourselves. We invented this stuff for ourselves. We took the best 
uh, techniques possible in the world. We analyzed it and we utilized it and we provided it to, to our unit. And we can, we can explore this experience for the whole variety of combat units. Because uh, like everyone's, everyone knows what happens in Mariupol, what happened in Mariupol. Yeah, all of the world, like the, the ice right now are opened. Yeah, the myths are broken. The propaganda is broken. No, 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 now everyone sees. Yeah, for me it's like a bittersweet feeling because like a sweet feeling is to sit here in Davos, yeah, to shake a hand, hands with the people who are in power, with the respectable people, with the people from uh, international organizations. And it's a great honor for me to present Ukraine in my unit here. Yeah, but bitter because like the price of this is human lives. And uh, for me also, back to the personal perspective, it was, it's somehow part of normal because in Ukraine we don't have other choice, we have to win. And the price of win is, is huge, is extreme. But we should not be extreme in all ways, yes? We should stay, we should, we should stay humane, we should support each other, we should protect each other, we should look each, uh, after each other. But uh, the Igor told about the combat, uh, combat brotherhood, yeah? It's this very sweet feeling that how people are experiencing the way that gives you the feeling of, of being alive when you're like surrounded by death. And uh, well, <laughs> for me it's also more, more, more sweet to know that we've been cultivating this kind of mindset, this kind of combat friendship and brotherhood in my unit. And <coughs> right now when we are like restoring our unit, well, regaining power, uh, I know that we're not alone. I know that uh, a lot of people, they, you know, we infected them with the idea of proper understanding of combat value and combat role of the, of the, of the military servicemen. And also, one more word about the people who, who drastically changed my perspective of understanding. When I returned from captivity from Moscow, well, I returned to a different country. Well, I have a very, like, bad prognosis is uh, back in May. Like, I, I had no idea what's going on, what's going after, what's going to happen. But when, when I returned to, to Kiev and I just, I've seen the people, I've seen their eyes, I've seen their dedication, I've seen their support, their united efforts. And I just like, wow, finally, now everyone fights but on the different fronts, on the different front lines. Some of them uh, are combat for, in a combat role, some of them just like fighting with the donations. Some of, some of the people like have guts to, uh, to bear arms and to fight in combat. Some of people have not, but well, I don't I'm not judging anyone because like everyone should be useful there where he is right now and how can be, and everyone should, have do, should do his own job, yeah. My job is like to serve, and I still serve. I I, ser I, I, I remained in service in 2017 after my, after, after my wound, after my injury. I stayed in service because it was a choice. It was a choice and I made my choice. We military, we given up our lives to the society and we expect nothing in return. But society gives us back a lot and this means being united. Thank you so much, and thank you for the work that you've done. And now I would like to speak with Yulia. Um, you know, there is a side to this war that often gets omitted. It is not just about, you know, who gets what and just fighting, but it's also about what kind of people invade Ukraine and what they do to Ukrainian people. And what we're dealing with here. And I think uh, Yulia here has a lot to tell us about this. And we would like to hear from the person who firsthand experienced uh, the Russian forces and how they behave. Yulia, the, the word is yours now. I would like to welcome everyone. This is my honor. I keep listening to 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 the to the air here. This is uh, something unconscious. I'm I, I keep waiting for for the shelling for artillery. This is not an illness. This is normal for me and for you as well, and for you probably.
There was a jam here, and we asked, uh, why is the jam? You can go. Maybe there will be shelling from or the, the missile. Yeah, this is the way of really looking um, at, at the reality uh, around. So our perceptions are different. And it's not because we are, we are special, but we can't, because we have special experience. There's too much iron in our bodies. We, uh, the, uh, the alarm systems go off in, in the airports when we go through, through the x-ray. So too much iron in our strong will. It's unbreakable will, and no one will be able to do anything with this country. I'm uh, looking at the this posh, uh, peaceful and calm Davos, and I it overlaps with, with the images of Mariupol, of the destroyed houses, killed children, killed animals, the constant shelling, the cars flying by, to evacuate at least someone, at least one, because people were dying right there on the streets. This is the destroyed city. I don't want the same thing to happen uh, here. Uh, the uh, integral part of my women uh, wardrobe is, is the armored vest. And I have a good one. So I don't want uh, girls in Europe and around the world to to have that piece of wardrobe. I want them to wear good silk dresses. And Russia has chosen the path of not just destroying the Ukrainian nation as it is, this is not just a genocide of the whole nation. This is the genocide of the idea of the free world. The, the, this is the, the way of the path of destro destroying the freedom of, of will, the, the dis destruction of uh, values that your uh, ancestors and our ancestors were dying for because the achievement of the European uh, nation and the nations of the free world is that it is based on the price that was paid in the past and that was a bloody price and I do hope that this war and I call it the third world war take into account all the powers that uh, are participating in the resistance uh, to the aggression. I do hope that this will be the last war and our um, grandchildren and chil uh, children will not see this again and that they will, w the, bell, uh, the, the, the bell will not go off in the airport when you go through the scanner. The, the price of the freedom do uh, is, is priceless, but you can, uh, you can understand this, but uh, feeling this, is not possible. Just take our words for granted. Thank you. I wanted to ask your opinion uh, on this subject. I often hear from, I live in the United States, so I communicate with a lot of people who are further from Ukraine than a lot of people in this audience or us here on stage. And uh, from Europe, people sometimes talk about um, giving up Ukrainian territories to Russia so the war will be solved and there will be some diplomatic solution. And I know that Ukrainians do not consider that. And I wanted to ask you specifically, why so? Well, first of all, this is the international law, and the territories that uh, Russia has bitten away uh, during the aggression, just from legal standpoint for the rest of the world, is the territory of Ukraine. That's obvious. But we have a different aspect here to deal with. Anywhere where Russia comes, they instantly, in a planned manner, uh, roll out uh, concentration camps. And not only physical concentration camps, but also the concentration camps that uh, 
that are called to impact the souls. This is a propaganda machine. What is happening on the occupied territories instantaneously um, impacts the people. Um, secondary, uh, then in the second wave is food and and uh, and uh, 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 medication. But the propaganda is what uh, really uh, burns the brains out, and people because of the fear are um, losing the common sense. It is really uh, horrifying when uh, you're being lied to all the time, where everything that is dear to you is multiplied by zero. And uh, the, the sufferings of the civil population on the occupied territories is, uh, is, 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 is difficult to be described. Uh, you have seen those uh, scenes in, in Bucha and, and Kherson and I think we will see more from Mariupol once it's re re liberated. I don't know what we're going to see there, but I will be there when we liberate um, Mariupol. I will uh, stay with my people until the very end. And thank you for your assistance. Please don't allow Russia to spread um, as the cancer. Uh, around uh, the world, because by occupying the territories, they are setting their rules. They that uh, uh, you um, wouldn't fit uh, for you, so they come and and spread further in the propaganda that is broadcasted from uh, sa from from satellites, Russian satellites, is destroying your willpower. Don't forget who we are. We are the people. We are the people of the free world. And against us, we have the horde, unfortunately. Thank you. I want to add something. Ilya, please. Uh, I have a something to add. Uh, the, the policy of uh, calming down the aggressor is the wrong way. It's not the uh, trading market like when you have trade, like territories for stopping the war, etc. First of all, you have to remember the motives of Russia in this war. They, do not, they don't want our territory, they don't want our resources, they do not want the people. Uh, basically, they just want to bring more death and to genocide us. Yeah? Because you can, you can basically see this, how they provide uh, these external politics and combined with military tactics. Their, their military tactics in Mariupol were extremely blunt, plain and simple, yet destroy as much possible civilian, as much civilians as possible. Uh, tanks basically destroying buildings uh, from from the top to the to the basement, just unloading full full ammunition stacks into them, and it's no military purpose to this. Uh, when I was looking uh, on the on the on the plans on the maps of Russian of of, Ru of Russian advance. Uh, about uh, how they are providing their artillery strikes. Yeah, they basically destroyed Mariupol mostly with artillery and uh, and and yes. bombs and air and air air strikes. Uh, the map of the of the strikes was like the square by square, just square by square, methodically. The military purpose of this is zero. This is basically nonsense. They spent a lot of ammunition. They spent a lot of human, uh, manpower. They lost a lot of manpower. We, we, we destroyed their manpower. But uh, their idea was, if, if you're looking like from military perspective on their actions and their tactics and strategy, you think that it's, it's idiotic, it's, it's, it's stupid. But when you put your point of view on the like point of like genocide civilians, everything becomes in place. Everything becomes, and a puzzle becomes complete. And that's what they do. That's what they do, they, that's what, why they should be stopped. They, they must be stopped. Uh, the, you know, <clears throat> the Russia should not exist. Russia should not exist because it's a, it's a threat to all the free world right now. Because right now all, all free world combined, united, fighting on the battlefield against Russia. But the battlefield, unfortunately, as they, in many, in many wars in previous centuries, is the territory of Ukraine. But uh, right now, like, it's the, it's the very decisive moment, very decisive moment, 
when we should like put the proper priorities because otherwise otherwise everything will be will be failed and everything will be futile thank you Ilya. before we move to another question i have uh, let's see masi what do you have to add on this yeah very briefly um, i can describe in detail this story but uh, in my childhood uh, in afghanistan we go to primary at five uh, and I remember I was going when I was five year old, uh, and uh, these trenches were uh, were dug uh, along the road so that they could bury the limbs of the people who were not recognized. But it was childhood. You're going to school. You have these trenches dug out next to the road. But why I'm saying this? I was born in 1984. This was the, the, the middle of the war. And then this, the war was still going on when I went to primary school. And Russia in Afghanistan was doing the same. They were doing the same in Syria, and they're doing this in Ukraine. And you know, it's important to understand why. And I'm just sorry for prolonging this, but I'll try to be too concise. There are two points here. Sorry, but I'm a lawyer. First of all, the difficulty of punishment is not so as difficult as inevitability of punishment. So if you're going to be punished uh, uh, for uh, uh, the uh, killing what, for 100 grivnia or for a million, uh, uh, and it will not scare you as much as the inevitability. So you will be punished no matter what happens. So. What it means is that we didn't learn our lesson from the Second World War, and Russia wasn't punished. We were hiring too much to to make to the conclusion to come to the conclusion about the Second World War. You have read the the, the books about the Second World War, how Jews were tortured. So we we uh, when I'm reading this, we we I thought, uh, can't all the people come together and stop this? And can we? do it now, this time around. So uh, the, the reality is that Russians uh, live as uh, beasts, and all the beasts um, are, are driven by uh, two things. The, um, the, the principle of suffering and the principle of, um, uh, of, en of enjoying uh, the process. Only a more mature race can have different principles and follow the motivation. So when you give 100 grimna to uh, the child because she's asking for money, because the cameras are around, that's one thing. When you give 1,000 grimna without saying, why, what do you want in return? That's a different story. So the Russia um, treats the rest of the world judging by themselves. They are, act like beasts. They are killing us in a rough way, thinking that we are going to be scared. If we're going to be scared of this, then we will turn into same type of beasts. And I think this, this the story now, I think, is very similar when you go by and the woman is being beaten up and you think, well, I have lunch to attend to, I have to go. So, unfortunately, um, well, and I will, uh, so the, the karma in Buddhism uh, uh, catches up with you because that same thing will happen to you. And this is what's happening to the humanity. This is not the issue for Ukrainians, not because we are smarter or, or, or better looking. I'm uh, Afghan by nationality. If the person, one person is suffering, no matter what the reason is, and those who started this aggression ha have to be punished, and the longer the punishment will last, the less sense there would be to repeat it. So we have to do our best to turn R Russian beasts into Russian human beings and doing this the same way as they like, by punishing this big way. And so, therefore, we cannot stop just by bringing back Donetsk and Lugansk and not the Crimea. We can't stop there. No way, because like this, they don't understand any other language. Only when we stop Russia, which happened to the USSR, remember, when they attacked um, Afghanistan, they uh, ceased to exist. And I think the same will happen to, to, to Russia. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, 
aggression against Ukraine will bring to Russia ceasing to exist. And that, that's it. I'm, I'm finishing that for sure. Because in, in, the, in the law profession, debates is the time that where a judge cannot uh, stop you. So, yeah, but um, the number of deaths that uh, have happened in Ukraine by now, and I'm not counting Russians, so I don't care about them. This is their prize. They started this for their inadequate wishes. But the number of people who killed, who died in Ukraine is not the price of our mistakes. This is the price of our willingness to push it to the end. Uh, we, uh, I'm not going to generalize, but I ha don't have a, a moral right uh, for those people who died. I can say, well, you you died, but now we're going to make peace with the enemy. If anyone can can really sleep okay with this idea, then probably you have left Ukraine. You're not there. But those who stayed, we can't sleep with that idea. It's better to die than do that. To die, not to be ashamed to continue living in the face of those who had died. So Ukraine will not stop at bringing back only Lugansk and, and Donetsk. I'm, I think there will be, cr the, the, this is about Crimea as well, and the best story would be bringing the responsibility to everyone who supported Russians, both among Russians themselves and among Europeans. And that brings me to one of my final questions, which I want to ask every panelist. Uh, what is needed the most right now for Ukrainians to win and how far Ukrainians will go. And I think we're going to ask Ihor first because uh, he still has connections, so we would like to use this opportunity. What we need most for the victory, we have to persevere to continue doing what we have been doing. Uh, sometimes, uh, the impossible thing, to make the impossible possible. We have already done that and we will continue to do so. Not a single artificial intelligence, not a single um, crystal ball would give Ukraine a chance against Russia. But here at the front line, most of my comrades in arms are not professional militaries. I. Uh, learned from YouTube how to use uh, the assault rifle uh, on the 24th of February. Most of uh, people around me used to be uh, miners, farmers, um, metal workers, um, IT experts, etc. But now they are the best trained military um, of uh, Europe and they are holding this front line. It is fantastic, isn't it? When a person of 60 years of age at the front line with no military training, official military training whatsoever, with no military rank, stays in the front line and supports all of his uh, fellow servicemen and servicewomen with his joke or with uh, some uh, practical assistance. So uh, fighting the enemy, he finds the time to make jokes. That is some something super uh, uh, human, I think. And we have to persevere, as I said. Of course, uh, we will have to do a lot. We have to improve our knowledge, skills, and training. And we have to improve our internal organization the way uh, the military is uh, managed. It is all about the right strategy, right tactics, about the development, organizational development for the military. And number three, uh, that's what uh, we uh, will take away from uh, this war, and that is that uh, ammunition is key. M military equipment is key. We uh, in the infantry do what we are supposed to do, and artillery is to cover up for us, to uh, protect us. And sometimes when they uh, run uh, sh low on uh, ammunition, uh, we are uh, almost helpless. So, and that uh, again is about. Uh, 
losses of human life, with uh, no parity, uh, being too outnumbered and outmanned and outgunned is uh, very difficult. Sometimes uh, we make one shot and they uh, return 10 shots. Uh, one. Um, uh, artillery uh, fire um, round will uh, be uh, retaliated with hundreds. So we have to be well equipped to liberate our territories that the enemy has captured. Uh, First of all, I fully agree with uh, your, with my uh, comrade in arms. Uh, armament um, and ammunition is very important. Even if you pay me to kill people, I will never take this money. You will not buy my motivation to kill human beings. But if you give us uh, the armament, we will be motivated to defend our country because this is the final boundary. We cannot uh, um, leave it. We cannot abandon it. We cannot desert it. There are a lot of Ukrainians who uh, are living and working in Poland now, but they all dream of returning to Ukraine. The same happened to my father who had to flee Afghanistan. He dreamt of uh, going back to his country. Uh, what happened to me, uh, we were driving in uh, the, uh, an armored um, car. It is. Uh, it looks like this. And then the shell got inside, and uh, we uh, hit uh, the mine and uh, a piece of shrapnel uh, caught me. So if it were just a, a capsule um, vehicle, uh, it will go out and uh, people will not uh, be hurt inside that uh, vehicle. So imagine a wounded person on a vehicle and hitting a mine and being wounded for the second time. So uh, there's a very little chance that uh, this uh, person will survive. So what we need is armored, um, armored fleet. Infantry fighting vehicles, uh, APCs and APVs, and we have to help uh, Ukrainian wounded and injured uh, servicemen and service women. And for that, we also need resources. Most of the uh, military who have been wounded dream of returning to the battlefield. I've got only one eye uh, remaining, and I can just get married, um, have children, and continue working in. Uh, my civilian profession, but I am now planning to return to the battlefield. And uh, I see uh, it as my task and calling, my vocation to help the military um, officers and soldiers who have been wounded or injured. So what Ukraine needs now most uh, is uh, military equipment, uh, arms, uh, uh, and ammunition, and any kind of help that can uh, re uh, Rehabilit uh, help our wounded to get rehabilitated and uh, return to the ranks. It's needed for the for the victory. <coughs> okay. Like uh, in the first days of Euromaidan, I was there to support people, to save uh, people's lives, uh, to help uh, the injured um, protesters. Uh, I feel the same. Nothing has changed. Uh, I've got the same uh, purposes, uh, the same tasks. I have to help people. I have to save people. Now I can do that to more people, not one by one, but I I can help the entire nation and perhaps the entire world to understand what war is about and uh, to help them help us. So, And what I also need, I need, is justice. Because justice is just what is understandable to every human being in the world.
it's justice. Uh, it's not about revenge. It's about justice. And uh, this uh, thirst for justice is moving me ahead. I don't hate uh, the enemy. I perceive uh, them as very sick people, patients of mine, if you wish. Perhaps they are terminally ill. I've never hated my patients because what they need is cure, is treatment. And those who cannot be cured should be punished or sent to another world. Justice and help is what we need. I see the um, Ukrainian military and civilians who suffered in the captivity and uh, have been released because I understand what happened to them there and my heart is uh, breaking. I thought that I um, had seen everything in the war but uh, what is going on in captivity is beyond uh, human. It defies any description and defies uh, human nature. And uh, like Masi, we keep calling him Masi, but he's Masi actually. Sorry, Masi. Um, uh, uh, as Masi, I've established my own fund to support the families of those that are currently in captivity. Because while they are there, somebody has to take care of their children, of their wives or uh, mothers. Um, and um, a week ago, I underwent a very serious surgery, and uh, I understand that I also need assistance. I am a civilian now. Uh, the government cannot take care of everyone, and we have to take care of ourselves and of those uh, like us. And this is yet another uh, aim that I strive to achieve, uh, to help uh, civilians who are waiting for their near and dear uh, from uh, uh, to return from captivity. And I want justice. Thank you. The last word is on me. Uh, I'm. I strongly agree with the previous speakers, like with Tyra, with Masi, with with Igor, about weaponry, about the shells, about ammunition, about uh, armored vehicles, about combat help, uh, about um, political political support, because it's very valuable. It's it, it means a lot. Because how far we can go, how far we Ukrainians can go, uh, according to, like based on my perspective of view, like for us, this war is like it's all in. It's all in. It's now or never. It's like we, we, we don't have we don't have the the luxury to 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 have a rest. We don't have a luxury to to be relaxed. No time for rest. Uh, we cannot we cannot lose because otherwise we we will be done. Uh, I've been telling these words back in the as of style times when I was making a lot of the interviews and the press press conferences because it was very you know. Uh, useful thing to have a live streams from a, from a combat line front lines and to inform the world about what is happening. Yeah, because I see how big impact it it created. Because for me, I'm just doing like side side job, uh, like from from my, from my uh, prime primary occupation. And right now, I'm 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 trying. Well, I'm forced to do even more because, uh, like, uh, I'm resting on the battlefield. This is the this is my zone of comfort because like I know the rules, the rules are simple for me, and this is normal. Right now I have I have to like do a lot of activities in civilian life, uh, also with uh, community organizations, uh, with foundations, with government, and also. Uh, like we also have uh, the foundation who helps uh, the the soldiers. I have a, um, I have a, like a few couple of conversation. I had a couple of conversation with with government officials about the same program to support uh, combatants, not just military. We have the same conversation, the same plans about doing uh, like 
people are asking us, yeah, military, especially me, like how to do better, how to do well, how to do correct. And well, gladly, gladly, I know a lot of things how to, how they should be done, how, how, how they can be done better. Because uh, a lot of people nowadays, uh, the, the same ideas appearing in their heads uh, and the same initiatives. And we have to combine, unite, multiply our power, multiply our resources. And for that, we need, we need more, more aid in, in all possible ways. Like, I, without, without any hesitation, yeah, for me, like, uh, I'm gonna say this uh, proud and loud, yeah, my unit is our regiment, the National Guard of Ukraine, uh, extremely requires uh, military aid and all kind of aid because we are restoring, like, uh, all, all our potential, basically from the ashes. We lost everything, and uh, nobody is caring about us. Uh, uh, like in in general, nobody govern, governs us. Yeah, just like we supported by the by the officials, by the government, and that's all. But why 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 is why is it it's important? Because I know how to teach people to become heroes. I know how to uh, motivate them even more. Uh, I know how to project these ideas widely. I know how to do it better. And my great goal is to uh, bring 10,000 very intellectual pers uh, intellectual elites in into the military. They should, be, they should be in the military. And in a couple of years, these people who will like witness these materials like death, life and death in the battlefields with their combat experience, they will become a great, great bulk for administrative control in Ukraine. And they will like improve drastically all, 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 all our lives and they will, like existence of these people with, these, with uh, this kind of experience will eliminate all, 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 of the, all of the problems that we have right now for the better future, for the world of justice, for the resources that are not uh, misspend and for the benefits of not just Ukraine and all of the free world. Thank you so much for sharing with us about the realities of the war and the work that you've done. Uh, I believe we still have a few minutes for Q&As, so I would like to open the floor for questions uh, to our panelists. If you have specific questions to one of them, please tell us. If it's a general question, just ask and we'll see who can take it. Okay. Okay, just very quickly, there's a common narrative that we need to give Putin a way out. We need to allow him to save face. What do you say to that? Who wants to take that? I can tell. Okay. Go on. Oh, you need to be. Just imagine a man right now. He comes into the middle of this room, he drops his pants and starts uh, to rape a woman. Should we think about saving his face, about giving him an off-ramp? Should we be saving the face of that man or a woman uh, who is a victim to uh, rape? We have to save the um, uh, victims. And if uh, it takes my life uh, to punish him, I will give it readily and selflessly. And it is a manipulation. You know, uh, in, uh, I had a case, a uh, legal case. Uh, we protected a woman or defended a woman uh, who was uh, splashed um, uh, acid into her face and she eventually died but when we were talking she told me if I die do your best for this murder not to go unnoticed uh, not uh, speak up so do not um, succumb to this manipulation do not allow the world to start speaking uh, even about saving Putin's face he doesn't have any face any human face if we save his desire to kill even though uh, Ukraine did not provoke this uh, war so what will we save what value will we be promoting uh, by doing so I would like um, uh, us to save the woman in Dnipro who uh, died when her husband uh, 
actually hugged her trying to save her from the shrapnel uh, that was raining down on her. But she died. And I think that her face is much more human and humane than that of Putin. So there is no saving that face. For a long time, Russia has been juxtaposing itself to the rest of the world. They say that uh, they've got an extra chromosome, that they are different from all other nations, all other peoples, all other ethnicities. If they believe so, so perhaps it would be okay that they are isolated in their country um, and they save their own faces, hands, uh, stomachs, um, spines, whatever they've got. I'm not sure that we are dealing with a human being with common sense when he uh, makes decisions. And I am not going to discuss uh, the uh, protocol of treating an insane person. First of all, for what? And secondly, what kind of face do you want to save? Like it's it, it's nothing to save at all. And plain, plain, plain and simple, uh, they they intend to break the rules and play how they want. Like. Okay, fine. They, they will they will re receive a very very uh, strong and intense uh, answer to to, the, to their intentions, and there is no there, there is no space for saving faces, at least when the save uh, face is lost already. I believe there is a question over there. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Lamy, and I have a question uh, still not open for me. Let's imagine that uh, Putin somehow disappear, die, and uh, what we're going to do as Ukrainian and what we're going to do together, Ukraine with the European Union, with uh, a Russian. Because when we are talking about the war, it's not Putin raped our women and it's not uh, the Putin kill our children and civil society. So it's a decision of the military. So it's like still open for me question, what are we going to do with this Russia after our victory? Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Uh, I wonder if maybe Yehor wants to say something because he's far away. Uh. Okay, what can I say? We have to define victory for Ukraine, first of all. What is it like to us? When I spoke to my comrades in arms, I gave two definitions, uh, our uh, program minimum and program maximum. Uh, the minimum task is to bring back all temporarily occupied territories, including the Crimea and the Donbass. Uh, just uh, return to our internationally recognized borders of 1991. But the maximum uh, task to us should be to destroy the Russian regime, because unless we do it, Ukraine would be under threat all the time, permanently. And nobody in the world will be able to guarantee that uh, Putin or another one uh, in Putin instead, this collective Putin, if you wish, would not um, wage a war against against us in five or ten years. So, and we understand that uh, our neighbor nation is mentally unwell. We expected them at the very beginning of the war that they would go out into the streets and protest against the war. But later it turned out that most of uh, the Russian population are in favor of this war and they support this regime. And until this le regime is destroyed, is liquidated, there will be no uh, victory. So you are the person on the front lines, and you are people who were on the front lines basically yesterday. And you're willing to fight till the end. From the Western perspective, how far would it go if the West does not provide enough military assistance that Ukraine needs to win? What would Ukrainians do? considering the spirit. And that's probably 
the wrap up of our session. So, Ihor, you're first. Okay, look, uh, we are in the battle. We are at war and every one of us and we are almost a million in the uniform all of us each and every one of us are ready to get killed there to die for our country we are ready to die for our victory uh, for our freedom uh, that just the um, line from our uh, anthem we are prepared uh, to do everything humanly possible and even impossible to achieve this victory and my good feeling tells me that uh, it won't be uh, a very um, quick victory it won't be over in a month or two it may take years and uh, we uh, have to run this marathon, uh, and every one of us, uh, people uh, at the front line, in the rear, volunteers, um, donor organizations, uh, should be united because it's not the armies that um, win the wars, it's the people, it's the unity of the people. And we are prepared to stand till the end. Merci. Yeah, uh, I, I'm indignant because of your question, you know. Uh, it's uh, as if we are uh, watching a detective movie and we are looking whether uh, the victim will be protected uh, or not. So, uh, so we take pop popcorn, we eat popcorn in the movie theater and we are observing something that is going on um, there on the screen. But I believe that the humanity has lost when the war began. All parties, all countries, you, us, all of us have lost because uh, people are being killed in this war. And we are all getting, as I said, partially dead. How many Ukrainians should be killed uh, for us not to think how far we would go, but uh, what else we need to do to stop this killing? A rhetorical question. And why do we ask uh, this question? Because we are scared, because you are scared. Scared for who? For the Russians? Over the 11 um, months of this war and eight year, years of the Longo War, have you ever seen a video or any piece of evidence um, showing Ukrainians torturing Russians. I'm sure you haven't. Over these years and months of the war, we've proven that our values are much more potent than our hatred, that our desire to um, uh, kill our enemies. I have got a, a video uh, footage of um, taking um, the uh, prisoner of war. Um, and when we took him um, prisoner, I heard uh, the uh, instruction of my uh, military commander, just provide him with m first m m medical aid. So, and he had to repeat it because I was uh, suffering from concoction and I couldn't hear uh, him well. He said uh, again, help him, he needs medical aid. Uh, this is not a, a war of our choice. Uh, it is unprovoked uh, when it comes to us. And we have proven that we are strong enough to stop uh, exactly where we need to stop, when we regain all of our uh, lands, um, when we uh, make uh, the punishment for the war criminals inevitable. Without this inevitability of uh, punishment, the war will not be over. That might be a trite um, metaphor, but uh, really silence kills. And it is the moment uh, when uh, this becomes a truism and it is very topical. It, silence does kill. So, uh, and uh, we um, believe that uh, a day will come, as Steve Jobs said uh, some time ago, if you live your every day like your last day, then uh, perhaps uh, it will be 
the last day. So perhaps uh, there will be a day when every active Ukrainian is killed by the enemy. And uh, it hurts me immensely. I uh, feel this uh, pain, um, uh, but I am sure that we are ready to die because we are on our land. We never invaded uh, Russia. Uh, we have been defending our country for more than eight years now. And we would not be uh, brought to knees uh, before Russia. We will not kneel to it. Okay. I am a bit tired, you know, of talking. You know, I I'm a bit worried um, uh, about Russia um, and the way it is once we uh, win. But uh, we should not speak too soon, right? Uh, we have to uh, defend ourselves. We have to uh, achieve victory in this war. And then the international community, the um, international uh, humanitarian law and any uh, and criminal law and any other uh, kind of law applicable would decide what to do with the Russian war criminals. Uh, yeah, uh, I am all for defending people and even pets like cats and dogs because people are innately good. They are naturally good and we have to defend them. And I do understand uh, the uh, international community uh, when they are worried about the future of the Russian Federation, who wields this nuclear power, and uh, you can never be sure that uh, their leaders are sane and are responsible. But before we come to that bridge, we have to actually uh, do what is on this uh, bank of the river. We need uh, the um, armament, we need uh, support, and we need to do everything to stop um, uh, the military kit uh, from the West uh, or any other part of the world from coming to the Russian Federation. Because uh, there is evidence and there is uh, uh, raw data about supplies of some spare parts for the production of uh, military equipment and armament, uh, um, production of missiles that later kill our children. So please uh, help us to stop those uh, deliveries and supplies of um, uh, military or dual-use uh, goods uh, to uh, the Russian Federation. We do what we can in the best possible way at the front line and in the rear in Ukraine. Please help us uh, at where you are, at your fronts, your respective fronts. Again, uh, about how far we can go. Uh, because of the situation in Ukraine right now, the world economy is like having a very strong hard times. Yeah, tremors, like dizziness, uh, like high temperature, fever. Yeah, fever of the world economy, that's true. Uh, the agricultural sector, the metallurgic se sector, the um, macrofinancial sector, the trading sector, and the crop sector, gas and oil sector. Yeah, and everything because of the situation that we are right now have uh, in our country, in our motherland. Uh, the problem is that how far we can go, we can go as far as we should. And this is not a question at all, it's the statement. Uh, about What about this thing that like, if we will not receive the support from West, well, we still will proceed, we still will do what we must, do what we should. Uh, even if there will be no uh, transparent, uh, wide financial and military support from the West, like, honestly, uh, I'm here, like, uh, I would be able to find the, the people who are uh, 
desperately want to help us, yeah, but probably not officially, probably officially, that does, it doesn't matter, and find, uh, find the, the in, in investments like for a couple of dozens of millions of dollars, yeah, to buy, to buy a, like a tank company or tank battalion or a couple of other nice things that we, that we need for, for, for the units like mine and my unit, yeah, and that's not a problem, it's, it's Davos, it's all of the money of the world is here, you like, we can buy a god, basically, with all respect. Uh, and uh, about the situation with Russia, back to the question that Solnia told, uh, asked about the Putin and about what if he will be, if what if he will disappear? Nothing will change because it's their uh, idea, idea of uh, government, idea of state. Yeah, because like Russians, it's not a, it's not a nation, it's not a people, it's the state. Yeah, and uh, only the elimination of threat. I mean, the state of Russia. Dissipation of the state of Russia will bring peace to the world, but uh, even though we have a like very complicated problem, yeah, probably, probably, uh, according to the fact that they have a lot of uh, resources uh, and nuclear power, uh, nuclear weapon, we weaponry, dissipation and dismemberment of Russia is very unlikely, because it is not a controllable situation, and well. According to that fact, I guess the controllable situation with <laughs> proper dismemberment of the Russian state will bring peace to the, to, to, to the region and to the world itself. And this is actually this far we should go. Thank you so much. We hear you very loud and clear. I can't thank you enough for sharing your perspectives. It's very important. Our time is up. Uh, thank you for being part of this panel. And I hope this conversation is not over and it will continue in different forms, in different places. Thank you again. Slava Ukraini. Thank you for your service.